We are excited that he's come from atheist to follower of Christ, and your sto his story is powerful, and you're going to love hearing it. If you would, welcome to our stage, Lee Strobel. <laughs> All right, now I feel like I've got to explain myself. Um, because it is true, yes, it's hard being a Cubs fan. My grandfather came to the United States from Germany uh, in about 1918 or so. Um, when his whole life, they never won a World Series. My dad, born in Chicago, lived his whole life, never won a World Series. I'm carrying the family tradition, apparently. But, but I have an excuse for being a Cubs fan. Uh, because when I was a toddler back in uh, 19, I think, 52, it, it was when it happened, um, I was a couple years old. My parents took me to a banquet where the speaker was Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks was a rookie. He was a shortstop, later became a first baseman. And he was speaking at this banquet. Well, I'm toddling around during the, you know, this little two-year-old, and I fell down behind Ernie Banks' chair. So he picked me up and put me in his lap, and I sat in his lap for the whole banquet, and at the end, he kissed me on the cheek. <laughs> so I have to be a Cubs fan. I, I have no choice. I'm bonded, you know, so... But it is a curse in many ways. <laughs> anyway, I am so glad to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, it's a great opportunity, I think, to talk about um, a topic I'd love to discuss, which is why Christians believe what we believe. I think it's interesting. I think it's important. Um, but I got to admit something to you up front. That is, there are times when I get into a spiritual discussion about the evidence for Christianity, and it does not go well. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but I had the most embarrassing thing happen a few years ago. I was down south uh, with a buddy named Mark. We were speaking at a conference, and so afterwards, we we're going to fly home. We had to get something to eat. So we saw one of these Cracker Barrel restaurants. Have you seen these things, Cracker Barrel? And I'd never been to one, but we said, let's go there. Okay. So we noticed that this one, I think all of them, if I'm not mistaken, have rocking chairs on the front porch where people can people watch. Well, sitting in the first rocking chair that we had to go past to get to the front door was a young woman. She was about 18 years old, dark hair, dark eyes, quite attractive. Sitting next to her was a young man about the same age. So we got to walk in front of him to get to the front door. Well, that's not a big deal, right? So we're walking along, and just as I step in front of this young woman, I hear her say, what's a deist? And I thought, I just wrote a book about that. So I turned on my heel. I said, young lady, a deist is someone who believes that God created the universe, and then he walked away. I said, a deist believes that God sort of wound up the universe like a giant clock, and he's just letting it tick down. I said, a deist believes that God is distant and detached from us and disinterested in us. But I said, that's not what the evidence shows. I began to talk about the evidence that shows God's involvement in the cosmos, God's involvement with humankind. I start giving all this facts, all this data, all this information. I start talking about the evidence of cosmology and physics and biochemistry and genetics, just loading her with all this stuff. And her eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm on a roll. You can't stop me now. I start talking about Jesus entering into human history. I talk about the incarnation. I talk about his miracles. I talk about his death. I talk about the evidence he rose from the dead. Her eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm going on and on. And finally, I turn to my friend and I said, can you believe it? I happened to walk in front of her and she said, what's a deist? My friend said, Lee. She said, buenos dias. <laughs> I really wish that were a joke. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. It was so embarrassing. But you know what the good news was? The ice was already broken. I mean, how do you not get into a spiritual conversation at that point? And we, we ended up talking about Jesus for about 45 minutes. So it turned out all right, but it was really embarrassing. Took her a while to get unfreaked out, I'll tell you that. Um, so I thought, well, here's a great opportunity uh, to talk this morning about some things. I, and my number one goal is to not embarrass myself. Uh, that's <laughs> kind of the, my lesson from that experience. But uh, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to kind of do something simple. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a story. It's a true story. It's my story. And it's a story that began in atheism. 
Because I decided at a young age, in fact, I was a teenager when I came to the conclusion that God does not and cannot exist. I thought that God didn't create people, but people created God. Why? Because they were afraid of death. And so they came up with this idea of this benevolent jelly bean in the sky and the idea of heaven when you die to, to try to make themselves feel better when they died. That's what I thought. I thought that the mere concept of an all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe was absurd, was not even worth my time to check out. Now, granted, I tend to be a skeptical person. I mean, my background's in journalism and law, so you can imagine you put those two things together, we're kind of a jerk, they're skeptic, that's it, that you get. Um, I was the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, and, and we used to pride ourselves on our skepticism. You know, we, we didn't want to accept anybody's word at face value. We always wanted to get two sources to confirm a fact before we print it in the newspaper. So we actually had a sign in our newsroom that said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> How do you know? Maybe she's lying. Got any proof, got any data, any evidence to back that up? I mean, that's the kind of skepticism we had. And so it's spilled over into my spiritual perspective. Now, because I had no belief in God, I really had no overarching moral framework for my life. And so I just sort of, you know, made up my morality as I went through life. My number one value was to bring maximum pleasure into my life. It was to keep myself happy at all costs. I mean, that was what my life was about. And uh, this is embarrassing to talk about, but I told Kevin, if I'm going to tell you my story, I'm going to tell you the truth. I lived a very immoral and drunken and profane and narcissistic, self-absorbed, self-destructive, honestly, in many ways, kind of a life. I mean, that's, that was my life. Had a lot of anger inside me, a lot of rage inside of me. Um, if you asked me back then, what are you so mad about? I, I probably couldn't have told you, but looking back, I know what it was. I was always after the perfect high. You know, I was always after that um, ultimate experience of pleasure. And time after time, I would get let down. And so I had a lot of anger and rage. I remember once my wife and I got in an argument, our little daughter was there, and I had so much rage, I remember I, I just blew up and I reared back and boom, I kicked a hole right through our living room wall. And uh, my wife's crying, the baby's crying, and I mean, that's, that was par for the course. In fact, I'm going to tell you the ugliest thing about me. When I was um, in that life, if my daughter... Allison was just, when she was a toddler, if she was playing by herself with some toys in the living room and she would hear me come home from work through the front door, her natural reaction was just to gather her toys and go in her room and close the door. Is she going to be drunk again? Is she going to be yelling and screaming and kicking holes in the wall? Yeah, I mean, at least it's nice and quiet in here. And that's the ugliest truth about me. My wife was uh, agnostic and spiritually confused. And so we moved into a condominium building one day outside Chicago. And the neighbor, whose name was Linda, was a Christian. And Linda became best friends with my wife, Leslie. And it was very natural in the course of their friendship for Linda to talk about Jesus to Leslie because it was just part of her life. And Leslie wasn't hostile. She never heard, nobody had ever told her this stuff before. So she asked questions. They had long discussions about God. They went to church. She went to church with her. And then finally, after many months of checking it out, Leslie came up to me one day and she said, Lee, I made a big decision. I said, what? She said, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> For an atheist, this is the worst possible news that you can get. I thought she was going to turn into some sexually repressed prude or something, you know, because she's going to spend all her time at Skid Row serving the poor or something. I, I, it's, not what I, it's not what I signed up for. So this was, was not part of the original deal. Um, honestly, the first word that went through my mind when she told me was divorce. 
I'm leaving. I'm out of here. But I stuck around, and, and what shocked me in the following months was the, ch the positive changes in her character and her values and the way she related to me and the kids. It was, it was winsome and it was attractive. And so finally, one Sunday morning, I'm, I'm sleeping off a hangover. She's getting ready to go to church. And she said to me, why don't you come with me today to church? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go. Get around this cult that she's involved in, you know. <laughs> so, so I go with her to her church, which is meeting in a movie theater about a mile from my house. And the pastor gets up to preach. And he's a young guy. I don't even think he was shaven yet. Um, <laughs> his name was Bill Hybels. And he gave a talk called Basic Christianity. And I remember sitting there, and it was like one after the other, he was just knocking down my uh, misconceptions about the Christian faith. And I remember walking out that day saying two things to myself. Number one, I was still an atheist. He did not convince me that day that God exists. But number two, I realized if this stuff is true, this has huge implications for my life. Yeah, duh. So <laughs> what I decided on that day to do was take my journalism training, take my legal training, and systematically investigate, is there any credibility to Christianity or any other world religion? And I launched on what turned out to be a nearly two-year investigation of the evidence. Now, it became very clear to me very quickly that, golly, you can get to the core of the issue of whether Christianity is true. You can get to the core of the question of, of whether or not it is the only way to God. You can get right to the, to the, to the basics of that through just one issue. There's one question is the key to this whole thing. You know what it is? Did Jesus or did he not return from the dead? That's the ballgame. Why? Because Jesus claimed that he was the Son of God. He got up before a group in John 10, verse 30, and he said, I and the Father are one. And the word in the Greek for one means we're one in essence, we're one in nature. And how did the audience understand what he was saying? They picked up stones to kill him because they said, you, a mere man, are claiming to be God. So Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. But here's the thing, so What? You could make that claim. I could make that claim. Anybody could claim that. But if Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, died, and then three days later rose from the dead, then that is confirmation that he was really telling the truth about who he was. That's why the resurrection is the linchpin of the Christian faith. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile you're still in your sins. In other words, this is the ball game. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is just hit some of the highlights that I encountered during my investigation of the evidence about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to do it using four words that begin with the letter E. That way it's easy to remember, and, you know, Easter's coming up in a couple of weeks, so you might have conversations with people about why you believe Easter is true, and, and this could be a way to Use the four E's to remember that. Now, before I get into that, though, I want to give you one fact to punch home, and that is, at the time I did this investigation, I was an atheist. So I did not consider the Bible to be anything special. I didn't consider it to be inerrant or inspired or um, special in any regard. But I had to accept the New Testament for what it undeniably is, which is a set of ancient historical documents. And I knew, just as you can investigate other ancient documents, like the writings of Josephus or Tacitus or other ancient historians, you can also take those same techniques and investigate the credibility of the New Testament. So in other words, I didn't just open the Bible and said, oh, it says Jesus was resurrected, end of case. I wanted to get behind that. How do I know it's telling me the truth? How do I know it really happened? So with that caveat... What are the four E's that summarize the evidence for the resurrection? The first E stands for the word execution, that Jesus was killed when he was crucified. Before you have a resurrection, you have to have a death, right? And so how do we know that Jesus really was executed and killed? Well, I found out very quickly in my investigation, there is no dispute about the death of Jesus Christ among scholars in the field. I'm, I'm including skeptical scholars, critical scholars, even atheist scholars. Why? Because the death of Jesus Christ is one of the best attested events of the ancient world. 
Um, you know, when you study ancient history, you're lucky if you get one or maybe two sources of information to confirm a fact. But in the case of the death of Jesus Christ, we not only have multiple early independent reports about his death and the documents that make up the New Testament, we've also got five ancient sources outside the Bible that confirm and corroborate the death of Jesus Christ. We have Josephus, a first century Jewish historian who worked for the Romans. We have Tacitus, another early historian. Even the Jewish Talmud admits that Jesus was executed and died. I mean, this is so well established, you would get laughed out of the academic world if you were to make the theory that, no, 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 Jesus was not crucified. Uh, in fact, the evidence is so strong in this regard that you could go to an atheist New Testament scholar like Gerd Ludeman of Vanderbilt University, and here's his conclusion. Again, this is the atheist evaluation. Quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable indisputable. Now, again, I don't know how much you study about ancient history, but there are very few things in ancient history that a critical, skeptical, atheist historian like Gerd Ludeman would say is indisputable. One of those things, because of the proliferation of accounts of it, is the death of Jesus Christ. The first he is for execution. We know that Jesus was dead. The second E stands for the word early. We have early reports or early accounts about the resurrection of Jesus. Reports that happen immediately after the event. Why is that insignificant? Because I used to think like a lot of skeptics that, okay, the resurrection, it's got to be a, a legend. It's a story. It's a made-up story. It's a myth. And we know that it takes time for legends to develop. So I figure that Jesus died in 30 or 33 A.D., and 100, 150, 200 years later, stories began to develop. People began to make up stuff about him. Oh, he, he did miracles. Really? Oh, yeah. And he rose from the dead. No kidding. Oh, yeah, sure. And they kind of made up this stuff as legend a long time later. That's what I thought. But what I discovered absolutely devastates the claim that the resurrection of Jesus is merely a legend. Follow me on this. This is so interesting, I think. We have preserved for us a creed of the earliest church, a statement of conviction that the earliest Christians right there in the first century would rally around based on facts that they knew to be true. This creed contains the essence of Christianity. It says that Jesus died, why? For our sins, he was buried, on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And then it mentions the specific names of eyewitnesses, including opponents and skeptics, whose lives were changed 180 degrees because they had encountered the resurrected Jesus. Now, what's important about this creed is that how early it was developed, how early it is reported. Scholars are convinced that this creed dates back to as early as two to five years after the death of Jesus Christ, and it was already in the form of a creed by then. Therefore, the beliefs that make up that creed go back even earlier virtually to the cross itself. In fact, one of the great scholars in this area is James D.G. Dunn um, of, of uh, University of Durham in England. This is what he said. This creed, this tradition, we can be entirely confident was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' life. So there was, here's the point, there was no huge time gap between the death of Jesus and the later development of a legend that he rose from the dead. We've got a newsflash that goes right back to the beginning. In fact, one of the greatest classical historians who ever lived was A.N. Sherwin White of Oxford University. He studied the rate at which legend developed in the ancient world, and he determined that the passage of two generations of time is not even enough for legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. We don't have two generations of time passing here. We got a newsflash that goes right back to the beginning. Friends, it would be unprecedented in the history of the world. It has never happened that a legend would develop that fast and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. And that's not the only early report we have. We have other reports in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the book of Acts, and the other writings of the New Testament documents, 
all of which are right there from the very first century, all of which were circulating during the lifetimes of Jesus' contemporaries who would have been all too happy to point out the errors if they were making this stuff up. Friends, we have an execution. Jesus was dead. We have reports of his resurrection. It comes so immediately after the event that it rules out the possibility that it's merely a legend. But that's not all we have. The third E stands for the word empty. We have an empty tomb. The historical data tell us that uh, Jesus' body was buried in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish council. It was sealed. Matthew tells us it was guarded by Roman soldiers, and yet... It's discovered empty on that first Easter morning. Now, we could talk the rest of the day, and I've written books about, you know, how we can have confidence that the tomb of Jesus really was empty. But we don't have all day, uh, and so I'm going to just give you one fact, because I think this one fact says it all, and that's this. Even the opponents of Jesus, even the enemies of Jesus admitted that the tomb of Jesus was empty. They admitted it. How do we know? Because they bribed the guards to make up the story that they had fallen asleep and that the disciples had stolen the body. Now, nobody believed that story then. Nobody believes it now. Disciples didn't have the motive. They didn't have the means. They didn't have the opportunity to steal the body. It was a stupid story. But what was it? It was a cover story. What were they covering up? The fact that the tomb was empty. You see what I'm saying? In other words, when the disciples first began to proclaim, Jesus is risen from the dead, the authorities didn't say, oh, no, he didn't. He's still in the tomb. Go check it out yourself. They didn't say that. What they said was, yeah, okay, the tomb's empty. We're going to implicitly admit that. And, yeah, okay. But we can explain how the tomb got empty. The disciples stole the body. That's how it got empty. So they're admitting the tomb is empty. They're just coming up with a story to explain it away. So even the opponents of Jesus are conceding that the tomb is empty. Friends, the question of history has never been, was the tomb of Jesus empty? Even the enemies of Jesus admitted it was. The question of history has always been this. How did the tomb get empty? That's the question. And you go down the usual list of suspects. The Romans weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus dead. The Jewish leaders weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. Disciples weren't about to steal the body. Why? So they could live lives of great deprivation and then knowingly and willingly allow themselves to be tortured to death for what they knew was a lie? I don't think so. I think the best explanation for the tomb being empty is that Jesus physically returns from the dead, especially when we combine it with the fourth word that begins with the letter E, which is the word eyewitnesses. Not only was the tomb of Jesus empty, but over a period of time, Jesus appeared alive in a dozen different instances to more than 515 eyewitnesses, to skeptics and doubters as, as well as to believers, to men and to women, indoors and outdoors, to groups and to individuals. People talked with them. They touched them. They ate with them. I mean, think of this, 515 eyewitnesses. This is a phenomenal amount of evidence. Uh, I covered, when I was at Chicago Tribune, one of my jobs was to travel the country and cover major trials that were going on. I never saw a case with 515 eyewitnesses. In fact, if we were to take, you know, this empty chair here and put it up on the stage and create, make it into a witness stand and call to the witness stand every individual who encountered the resurrected Jesus and allow them to testify and be cross-examined for just 15 minutes each, and we were to sit here around the clock, do you realize we'd be sitting here for five straight days? How many of us, after hearing 168 straight hours of eyewitness testimony, would walk away saying, nah, I don't believe it? <laughs> I mean, this is, it's just amazing. Uh, remember I said if you have one or two sources of information from the ancient world, you're doing pretty good. Well, for the conviction of the disciples that they had encountered the resurrected Jesus. We don't have one or two ancient sources. We have eight or nine ancient sources right there from the first century, both inside and outside the New Testament, that confirm their conviction that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. This is a phenomenal amount of historical data. In fact, it is so much evidence 
that even the atheist historian Gerd Ludemann was forced to make this admission, quote. He said, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. That's the atheist speaking based on the historical evidence. I couldn't have said it better myself. But doesn't that raise a question in your mind? Like, why is he still an atheist? <laughs> you know why he's still an atheist? Same reason I was still an atheist. We found the loophole. There's a loophole that explains all this away. You know what it is? These disciples didn't encounter the resurrected Jesus. They merely had hallucinations. Could be, right? There you go. It kind of explains it away. Case closed. Well, that's what I thought, but you know what? I'm a journalist. I try to check things out. So I went to a scholar. I went to an expert on the human mind, an expert on hallucinations, a guy with a Ph.D. in psychology. He was a professor of psychology for 20 years at a major Midwestern university. He was the author of about 30 books on psychology. He was the president of a national association of psychologists and counselors. So this guy had all the credentials in the world. And I laid out all the historical evidence for him. And I said, now, Dr. Collins, would you not admit to me these Disciples did not encounter the resurrected Jesus. They merely had hallucinations. And he looked at me and he said, Lee, that is not possible. I said, what do you mean it's not possible? He said, Lee, you have to understand something about the nature of hallucinations. Hallucinations are individual events that happen in minds. They're like dreams. Uh, it's not like I can say to you, how do you like that dream I had last night? You can't, you don't share dreams. It's not like you can wake up your spouse in the middle of the night and say, honey, honey, wake up, wake up. I'm having a great dream about a vacation in Hawaii. Let's both go back to sleep. We'll have the same dream. We'll save all the airfare. We'll save all the hotel costs. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Don't you wish we could do that? Why can't we do that? We can't do it because dreams happen in individual minds. They don't spread like the common cold. And then he said something I'll never forget. He said, Lee, 500 people having the same hallucination at the same time would be a bigger miracle than the resurrection itself. <laughs> and then he added this. He said, by the way, if these were merely hallucinations, then I assume the body is still in the tomb, right? Oops. The body's gone. Friends, these were not hallucinations. These were not visions. This was not wishful thinking. This was not a legend, a mythology, make-believe. These were actual encounters that the disciples and others had with the resurrected Jesus Christ, and it radically transformed the people who encountered them. I mean, think about this. The historical data tell us that after Jesus is put to death, the disciples are depressed, they're despondent, they're dejected, their leader is gone. They're afraid they're going to get put to death. They're, they're cowering, they're hiding. And yet, the historical record also tells us just a few weeks later, in the very same city where Jesus had been publicly executed, these once cowardly disciples are now proclaiming with boldness that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but he backed it up by returning from the dead. And they were willing to proclaim that message to their deaths. And here's what's significant about that. Because you may say, sure, there have been a lot of crackpots throughout history who've been willing to die for their religious beliefs, right? And that's true. Um, but there's a difference between the disciples dying for their message and somebody, let's use an example of the 9-11 terrorists. Why were those terrorists willing to die for their belief um, and, and their religious convictions that they had been taught? Why, why were they willing to die that way? Because they sincerely believe with all of their heart if they died that way, they go to heaven. And so they were willing to die. So, you know, don't tell me that the disciples dying for their faith means anything. No, but here's the difference. Here's the difference. Let's use that terrorist as an example. He was taught if he died that way, he'd go to heaven. He believes it. He has faith in it. Does he know for a fact that if he dies that way, he'll go to heaven? No, he can't know it for a fact. 
He just was taught it. He had faith in it. He believed in it. And so he was willing to die. But he doesn't know it for a fact. And so his willingness to die doesn't tell me anything about the ultimate truth of his religion. In contrast, think of the disciples. Of all the human beings who've ever lived in history, they were in a unique position because they were there. They just didn't have faith that Jesus rose from the dead and proved he's the son of God. They weren't taught it. They didn't just believe it. They were in a position to know for a fact whether it was true or whether it was a lie. They were there. They touched him. They talked with him. They ate with him. They knew the truth. And knowing the truth, they were willing to die for it. That does tell me something about the ultimate truth of what they were proclaiming. Friends, I spent a year and nine months investigating this kind of evidence until a Sunday afternoon. And I just, my head was full of stuff over this two years. I mean, I I needed a process. I I needed to reach a verdict. And so I went alone in my bedroom. And I took a yellow legal pad, and I just, I thought, I'm just gonna summarize the evidence I've encountered. And so I started writing. Summarize. It's page after page after page after page after page after page, writing all this stuff. And finally, I put down my pen. And I said, wait a minute. In light of this avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realized it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. <laughs> Honestly, I mean that. I, I, I mean that. I felt like, I felt like having dug into the minutia of the evidence and seeing how strong it is that the only way I could maintain my atheism, I pictured it like swimming upstream in a river against a torrent of evidence flowing in the opposite direction. I I couldn't do that. I was trained in journalism and law to respond to truth. And so on that day, November the 8th, 1981, I reached my verdict. I believe, based on the historical data, that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, and he backed it up by returning from the dead. And then I thought, is that it? Because I was kind of let down. I, I, kinda, I thought, it's kind of anticlimactic, you know? This is, is that it? But, but then I remembered something. I remembered a Christian friend had pointed out a verse to me earlier. So I got the Bible, I looked it up. John 1, 12. It says, but as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And so I noticed something. If you extract the active verbs from that verse, it forms an equation that spells out with precision what it means to become a child of God. Believe plus receive equals become. Ah, no, I was getting somewhere. I said, okay, I got the believe part down. Based on the data, I am convinced Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He backed it up by returning from the dead. I believe that. But I realized that wasn't enough. I had to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for me when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sins, past, present, and future. And when I would receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life, then I would become a child of God. So I got down on my knees next to my bed, and I poured out a confession of a lifetime of immorality that would absolutely curl your hair. And at that moment, I received complete and total forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and I became a child of God. And my very first thought, I mean, I got up, and my very first thought was, um, hey, Leslie might be interested. I should probably let her know, you know? I I figured she'd want to know. I didn't know, but so I I walked out of our bedroom, and I walked down the hallway, and I I looked in the kitchen, and, and Leslie was standing behind the kitchen sink, in front of the kitchen sink. Um, And standing in front of her, remember I told you about my daughter, Allison. She was almost five years old by by then. And Allison was standing on her tippy toes and reaching out, and for the first time she was able to touch the faucet. So I walked down the hallway, I looked in the kitchen, and Allison sees me and says, Daddy, Daddy, look, look, I can touch it, I can reach it. I said, wow, you're really getting big. She ran off. 
And I turned to Les and I said, honey, that is exactly how I feel. I said, I feel like for the last two years I've been reaching out and reaching out and reaching out. I just touched Jesus. He is alive. He is the son of God. He is resurrected from the dead. I just gave her my life. And she looked at me. She looked at me for a second and, and then she just burst into tears. And she threw her arms around my neck and she said, um, you hard-hearted son of a Baptist, I've been telling you this for two years, hello. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, she didn't say that. <laughs> that would have been funny, but she didn't, <laughs> she didn't do that. No, she, she looked at me and she burst into tears. And she threw her arms around my neck and she said, oh honey, I almost gave up on you a thousand times. She said, when I was a new Christian, I met some women at church, and I told them about you. I said, I don't have any hope for my husband. He is the hard-headed, hard-hearted legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He will never bend his knee to Jesus Christ. And she said, this one elderly, white-haired saint kind of put her arm around her shoulder and kind of pulled her off to the side, and she said, oh, Leslie, no one is beyond hope. And she gave her a verse from the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36, 26, that says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And unbeknownst to me, my wife took that verse, and she prayed that verse for me virtually every day for that two years of my investigation. And can I tell you what happened? Starting on that Sunday afternoon, now that I was a child of God, and not overnight, but over time, as I was then baptized, as I learned to read the Bible now with fresh eyes, as I learned to pray, as I learned to worship, and so um, God began to answer that prayer because my values changed and my character changed and my attitude changed and my morality and my, my relationships and my, uh, uh, I mean, every aspect of my life began to change for the good. And this is where I would always get stuck. Because people would say, well, tell, tell me your story. And I would get to this point, and I wouldn't know what else to say because I didn't know how to tell someone the difference that Jesus Christ has made in my life because you didn't know me. So how could you really know? You didn't know me when I was winning awards for investigative reporting, and on Sunday night, I was literally drunk in an alley in a gutter. So what do I, what do I, what do I tell you to explain the difference? Do you see what I'm saying? And I wrestled with that and prayed about that. And honestly, the only thing I've been able to come up with to crystallize it so you'll understand is what happened to my daughter, Allison. You think about it. Here's a little girl, five years old. All she knew the first five years of her life was a, a daddy who was absent or angry, kicking holes in walls, coming home drunk. That was her entire world. But starting on that Sunday afternoon, she began to watch and observe and listen. Something was happening to her dad. She never interviewed a scholar, never studied archaeology, never, you know, she's five years old. All she could do is watch. Something's going on. Something is happening. So it, it went on for five or six months after I gave my life to Jesus Christ that she would watch and observe, and it was a Sunday morning when it happened. She went up first to her Sunday school teacher, and then to my wife, Leslie, and you know what she said to him? I want God to do for me what he's done for Daddy. 
And at age five, my little girl gave her life to Jesus Christ. And today, she's 36 years old. She's married to a seminary graduate. Together, they write children's books about God. She is the mother of two of my three precious, precious granddaughters. And she is my very best friend. And my son, same thing. He came to faith at a young age because something was happening in his family, good things. And he gave his life to Christ at a young age, but he went an academic route. He went out and he got an undergraduate degree in biblical studies, and then he got a master's degree in philosophy of religion. Then he got another master's degree in New Testament. And just recently, after many years of research and study in Europe, he was awarded his PhD in theology from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Because he said, Dad, there's a whole generation out there, you know, my generation, they don't get it yet. They don't understand. This isn't based on wishful thinking and legend and mythology and make-believe. This is based on a solid foundation of historical truth. And I said, son, you've got your PhD now. Go tell your generation. Friends, God changed my life. He changed my son. He changed my daughter. He changed my wife. And now... He's working in the lives of my tiny little grandchildren. And that's my story. So what do you do with it? What, what, do, you, what, what, do, you, what do you do with it? Let me, let me just end with this. Let me just go back. Just give me a minute, couple minutes. Let's go back to that equation. Believe plus receive equals become. And I just want to apply this story to you. Some of you might be here today because a friend invited you, and you're spiritually kind of checking things out. You're not sure where you're at. You may be a skeptic like I was. Thank you for coming. But you say, believe plus receive equals become. I do not yet believe. My message to you is that is okay. That is okay as long as you do what I did and you check it out. The Old Testament and the New Testament both say, if you sincerely seek God, guess what? You're going to find him. So check it out. I met a guy after the last service. He's an attorney, a former prosecutor in Chicago. Um, He was an atheist. He read my book, The Case for Christ, and began his journey. And he said, Lee, it took me five years because I checked all your footnotes, and I read all the books you referenced, and I needed to go further. And now he's a follower of Christ. And his little daughter was there as well, who's a Christian now. Um, so if, 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 if you don't yet believe, you owe it to yourself to check it out. And we'll give you a free copy of my book, The Case for Easter. It goes into far more depth than we are able to go to, into this morning in terms of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So that's our gift to you. If you want, you know, and it's a great place, great church to come to, to ask questions, to check things out. Um, but if you don't yet believe, check it out. But here's how I want to end. Listen to me on this, please. Maybe you believe, but you've never received. Your life hasn't changed. Your kids wouldn't see a difference in you. You believe the right stuff, and maybe it's just for the last three minutes, or maybe it's for 30 years, and you can recite the Apostles' Creed, and you come to church, and you try to be a good person. But why is it when you come to church and you hear people talk about how they have a deep and vibrant and real relationship with Jesus Christ, in the back of your mind you're thinking, it's not like that with me. Why does God always seem so distant from me? Could it be because you you believe the right stuff and that's a great first step, but you've never received and thus become a true child of God? I'm just asking the question. Friends, if you're not sure God doesn't want you in a state of confusion about this. The Bible says these things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. He doesn't want you living in confusion and tension. Am I okay with God? He wants you to know. You can know. If you believe and receive, you have become. So if you're not sure, then let's resolve it. Why Why not make today the day that you can... Drive a stake in the ground. Say, today is the day 
that I know I received Jesus Christ. And I know, according to John 1, 12, I have become a child of God. And even if I say that, you know, I regret the fact I didn't bring my daughter to just stand here and, as a daughter of someone who's, who, who was wrecking the family and look at you and say, what part of this gift of God wouldn't you want? Forgiveness of all of your sins, eternity with God forever. What part of this don't you want? For your sake, yes, but for your children and the influence you'll have on them, the influence you'll have on your grandchildren and great-grandchildren yet to be born, the legacy that you will leave. Friends, if you're not sure, let's resolve it right now. Let's just close our eyes and bow our heads. If you want to take that step, then... In your heart, you can say these words. You don't have to say them out loud. Just in your heart. God will hear you. And by the way, you know, you may say, yeah, yeah, but I've got some peripheral doubts. We all have some peripheral questions. We will never know everything in this side of eternity. But I'll tell you what, you do not have to know everything to know something. You know what you can know with confidence? Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, and he backed it up by returning from the dead. That's all you need for now. So if best you can, if you believe, as best you can, then in your heart just say, Lord Jesus, as best I can, I do believe that you are the one and only Son of God. And I confess to you right now, Lord Jesus, that I have not lived the perfect life. I've sinned, I've hurt people, I've done things that I knew were wrong and I did them anyway. And I confess that right now and I want to turn from that and I want to walk your path with your help. So right now, Lord Jesus, I reach out in repentance and faith and I receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you purchased on the cross when you died as my substitute to pay for all of my sins, past, present, and future. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me so much. You went through the torture of the cross so that we could be reconciled in this world and the world to come. Lord Jesus, help me to live the kind of life that you want me to lead because from this moment, on. I am yours. And now, Father, for those who took that step today, we celebrate that. It's just as those in the previous services who, who, who've taken that step, we know that the party is still going on in heaven. We know what adventure and joy awaits those who put their trust in you through your Son, Jesus Christ. So we celebrate that. Father, for those who aren't ready yet, who still have too many questions, too many doubts, we pray by your Spirit you would use the books, the the church, whatever, friends, to help these dear people come to the point where their eyes will be open to their need for a Savior and that we might someday celebrate their rebirth as well. And Father, for those of us who've been your children for a long time, we thank you that we have such an incredible message to tell the world. We thank you for this church that shines your love and grace and compassion and mercy far and wide. We thank you for all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Father.